Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's stand-up meeting for FPGA and Remote Labs at Open Research Institute. It is the 20th of September, if you can believe it, of 2022. And we are here to talk about what we did over the past week, what we're doing over the next week, if we have any roadblocks, and if we need any resources. And hello, everybody. All right, let's uh, let's go around and, and see what's up. All right, uh, hey, Paul, you have the floor. Hello there. Um, well, we wrapped up Him Expo uh, this last weekend, and uh, that's consumed a fair amount of horsepower over the last couple of weeks for me. Uh, not much going on in the remote lab. I don't have any immediate roadblocks. I think that's about about it for here. All right. Thank you so much. All right, James. Let's uh, let's hear how it's going. Uh, not too much to report here either. We're just keeping on. We're continuing more work on getting the main building up. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Nothing otherwise major to report. Everything's been going well here. Yeah, he says that nothing is going on or very little is going on, but I'd like to, to, um, to stick up for that. Uh, there's a lot of physical plant work going on at Remote Lab South. So thank you so much for everything that you've been doing. Um, and I've been, I've been talking to Keith about uh, delivery of the lab supplies and what's needed in terms of support. Um, so I just wanna uh, highlight that uh, uh, there's a, there is an awful lot of work and it's, it's hard, useful work that will create a, a really amazing open source laboratory for people in the center part of the United States. Uh, so this lab is in is on Arkansas, which is actually pretty close to everything if you look at it on the map. Um, the, what we're what we've uh, learned about is um, you know some some additional ways to to get open source FPGA design done. So what we might do is to see if we can set up uh, those particular uh, functions in Remote Lab South. Um, and that would mean that Remote Lab West would stay with the Verilog VHDL through um, a floating um, Bovado license and traditional MATLAB support to do open source work. And that um, maybe Remote Lab South might be interested in leveraging more of the upcoming open source tools, tool chains. And these are these are things that I, I should probably say are, are not yet uh, up to the same maybe level of performance or are not able to address the, the really large FPGAs. This has been a, uh, a thing that's gone on in open source FPGA design for many years. Um, and I'll have to go back and see when, when Matt Edis at Edis Research um, addressed this himself. Uh, someone asked him in public if he would why you know why didn't Edis Research use uh, open source uh, tools and and open source uh, methodologies? And he said that you know at the time they were well into the third generation of of USRPs, um, and that the open source FPGAs were not yet up to the USRP one, and that as soon as that happened, that there was some way for him to to pull it into to the collection of of commercial products he would. This is somewhat of an unfair thing to ask open source community people to do because we don't get a lot of help at all um, from, you know, in, 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 in to integrate. And obviously we wouldn't because this is a, com a, com a competition, a competitive deal. Um, but we, we have a rapidly changing landscape in, in FPGAs and anything that we can help open source work in FPGA design move forward, we should. So over the next week, we'll be talking a lot more about this particular um, tool uh, approach and there might be a way to provide some diversity within Open Research Institute remote labs to where you can use traditional Vivado approach, which has been very effective for us and is industry uh, widely supported in industry with Xilinx uh, parts, and then also have uh, a, a open source tools option as well. Uh, we've gotten a steady steady flow of comments from the community that they really like for us to to also address the tools side of the house and not just the product. Um, and our our approach has generally been pragmatic. We use whatever the right tool for the job is to get open source designs out there into the public and we're unapologetic about it. Um, but helping the tools side 
you know, the tool maker side rather than the tool user side, that's in our best interest and is also within our mission. So there'll be more opportunities to talk about that over the next week. Anyway, thank you so much, James and, and Keith and everybody in Arkansas for all that you're doing. Um, I know that it's been uh, challenging and that the weather has also <laughs> been a challenge. That isn't something that we have to face in Remote Labs West and it's less of something that is a challenge for Remote Labs in the UK. All right, Anshul, you have the floor. Hey, uh, this week uh, I made progress with Versatune Receiver. Uh, now my setup is ready, faced some issues. So I had a call with Art and uh, now uh, the transmitter part, the receiver part and the flow of stream, uh, everything is working fine. Um, so yeah. Now I have to get a code. Uh, I have to get code from Bob and compile it at my end and make an image and then try with that one before I start making changes into it. Uh, so Bob is a bit busy, but whenever he gets time, he will provide me with the code and the steps for doing compilation. And then I will proceed forward. On uh, encoder side, I'm trying to uh, uh, fix the issues that are there with MQTT control um, and basically fix the error means I'm trying to adapt it to ZC706 rather than Pluto board. So making progress on that. Yeah, that's me. Thank you, that's a lot. Uh, any resources or, or anything that you need at this point? No, uh, I think earlier, I, last week, uh, when I gave my status update, I was confused what all modules or binaries or scripts need to be executed on the PS part and what all need to be executed on the laptop. So uh, I think uh, the Everest chipped in and he provided the details, so it's clear now. Okay, that's good news. Thank you so much for all of the work. It's really appreciated. In your opinion, do you think that the Versatune would be a good component of a ground station? uh in the sense what's the use case you're trying to ask here for a satellite ground station do you think that the functions for receive or are would be good for ground station work uh yes uh i mean it, in a sense it supports dvbs and dvbt but there is no support for dvbs2 or s2x so okay. yeah that's yeah. where it was, uh, okay well it's a no it's an excellent project and i'm i'm very much looking forward to it coming to hamcation in 2023 so yeah. i think it'll be a really fun thing to show and support yeah right, right absolutely and one more point i want to add uh it's fpga code uh that was added by charles it's all proprietary so uh we don't have access to it if you okay. want to add DBS2 or DBS2X. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe there's an opportunity there. We'll we'll talk more about that. Yep. All right. Thanks so much. All right. So yes, Ham Expo, uh, a large amateur radio twice a year show, uh, happened this past weekend, and we had five presentations at it. We had three project exhibits. Those are essentially like poster sessions. Um, at a at a uh, academic conference, um, and they were the support was fantastic for that. Uh, you had a Q and A tab on your browser, so you could answer questions that people had at the that left at the poster session, uh, and people could download the poster as a PDF. Uh, we also had a booth with lots of links to our website and and all of our resources and our YouTube channel. Um, and it's a really fun looking booth. Um, and all of the Q&A for, for our talks went, went pretty darn well. Um, the, the response was constructive and positive. So out of all the shows that we've gone to over the past couple of years, um, this one was great. This one was good. Uh, we would really like to see attendance go up at Ham Expo and, uh, and it to continue. Uh, so so we'll, we'll, be, we'll be sure to be a supporting partner moving, moving forward. Uh, all of those recorded presentations will be available for the next month for the next month on the platform at Ham Expo. It included a Ribbit 
talk, uh, presentation and poster uh, from the Ribbit team. That's UHF, BHF, digital communications without any extra equipment or wires, just through an Android app. And the Android app plays, plays the tones of uh, SMS over any HT. Uh, so we intend for this to be VHF, UHF, ham, but it can be any radio that has a microphone can then be turned into a digital communications device. Uh, so that open source project got a lot of traction and great questions. That was one of the presentations and one of the project exhibits. Uh, Paul and I uh, did two talks each. Uh, Paul did uh, Opulent Voice, so a sort of a, a explanation and the background of, of all the the ins and outs of uh, digital voice codecs and and where opulent voice is uh, new and exciting for very high bit rate compared to the other alternatives um, and then also did authentication and authorization for amateur satellites and that got some interesting questions and a very technical talk in my opinion and i did um, the open source heo project that we're that we're starting a uh, proposal that will go to jamsat uh, and walked through all the slides and explained the regulatory background. And then I did a, a talk on the artificial intelligence and machine learning and the future of amateur radio and introduced our proposal for a AIML amateur radio handbook to give practical, easy to do, uh, as easy as possible, uh, a artificial intelligence and machine learning stuff for, for amateur radio experimentation. So last week I promised um, my I was hoping that I would actually be able to implement the Verilog FSK demodulator. Uh, I didn't, but I I did clean up the drawings and do some documentations uh, of that. Uh, so I'm really happy to be able to share that with you all today, and I'll I'll put it up on the screen as soon as I can find it. There we go. Okay, so this is from the, let's see, yeah, that's a good place to start. This is from that same body of work, the uh, the, the open source uh, FSK decoder, demodulator and modulator on GitHub that I talked about last week. And so what I did is kind of made uh, in draw IO some diagrams. The one that you should be seeing right now is the overall top block, the FSK demodulator, and it shows that there's two synchronizers and edge detect in it. And this is showing actually what the edge detect does with a correction to a mistake that I had last week um, where I didn't have the, the clocks lined up correctly with the, with the R0, R1, R2, pause and neg. So now this is, I'm, com I'm more confident that this is correct. I also did the synchronizer to explain a little bit about what the synchronizer is doing. It's just to get to guarantee setup and hold time for, for the uh, limits uh, for the high and the low, which is the zero and the one for binary FSK. So it looks like this design is set up to have adaptive uh, limits comparisons for, you know, are you a high tone or a low tone? Uh, that's what the short and the long are, are aimed for. Uh, so not necessarily static. And here is actually the logic from the demodulator. And so you can see this orange, I apologize to anybody that has challenges with um, with color blindness. I'll, I'll double check and make sure that these are good uh, colors to use. Um, but you can see the orange slant, that's, the, that's that register that is counting up and it just waits until it gets a the most significant bit of the ADC negative going, and then it makes a call. And then is it larger than the upper limit or is it smaller than the lower limit? You can see left and right, two examples of, of tones. Now this is a very simple FSK demodulator and it only works for, right now, the code only works for binary FSK. It's extensible to four area FSK, which is what we use for our transponder. So the next step is to convert this into four FSK and get it working on our dev boards, our development station and remote labs. Um, eventually, I think that we will not want to have, rely upon a time domain um, interpretation like this, but this will get us up and running. And it, it does provide to the community, to the amateur community, an example of, of how you write these sorts of things so that you can do communications with your FPGA. There's just not a whole lot of stuff out there uh, for, for those of us that want to experiment with FPGAs, 
And with the prices falling all the time and with so many SDRs, this is really something that, that needs to be a resource uh, for folks out there. So that's just one of the things that we uh, are hoping to, to be able to, or one of the things that we're going to, to publish out of this, this process. Uh, all right, so I'll stop share. All of this will be available, um, you know, um, with high resolution in, in the repo. And I'll, I'll put a link out to the, to the mailing list. All right, thank you so much. This is, uh, it's exciting. We got plenty going on. The, um, right before Ham Expo, uh, that Saturday morning at 4.30, I presented the, the HEO project to the general membership meeting at JAMSAT. They're going to have the entire script of the presentation for the highly elliptical orbit open source amateur satellite presentation in their um, upcoming JAMSAT journal uh, translated to Japanese to solicit opinions from the membership. So we're hoping to be able to collaborate with them if they accept the proposal. And then we start adding other uh, AMSAT organizations if they want to participate, other open source groups if they want to participate, and industry partners that we have and we'll get uh, to to this effort to get a HEO uh, launched. Um, and it went really well. The, the, the comments and questions from uh, the JAMSAT membership were very good. I am highly appreciative of the leadership of JAMSAT. They've been extremely wonderful. And I am so happy that they have people that can translate English to Japanese because my Japanese is extremely limited. <laughs> and, I, and I, you know, uh, but this is a, a, a wonderful active group. So that went well, um, and we'll we'll know more soon. Um, we also sort of presented, at least online, to Libra Space Foundation. So the work that we're doing on for the FPGA has been presented to a, a variety of groups over the past just few days. And um, already we have some really good questions from both Libra Space Foundation and from, from JAMSAT. So the editor of the JAMSAT journal has some specific questions for us. We really narrowed down a few things in the presentation. Uh, so I'll be putting that out on the list just to keep everybody informed about, about what we need to do. Uh, I'll be asking the propulsion team and the board of directors of of ORI, uh, you know, specific questions about about how how we plan uh, to continue the funding. You know, what are what the what the timeframes are for a lot of different things. Um, so plenty uh, going on just over the past week. Very exciting. I think we're going to need more FPGA people. I think we'll need more human resources. Maybe. Maybe not a lot more, but we definitely need more in order to to really like filter out and to 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 really get the uh, the integration done. And it's kind of an open question here. I mean, we're we're using our our Earth based development stations, and we know that we have a path to to radiation hardened uh, offerings. There are going to be expensive, but we know we have a path. But I'm not, you know, we don't really have. I think enough folks to close the loop as rapidly as I'd like. So if you if you know of anybody that you think would be a really good uh, person uh, for this work, uh, then please let them know about what we're up to. And you know, this is a this is an ambitious project, but it's within our our abilities to do. I just like to see more stuff working over the air. That's my um, so, sort of my my superstitious belief is that it doesn't work until it's working over the air. Really like to see the downlink uh, transmitting, and I'd I'd really like to to figure out how to turn uh, even the simple FSK into to working receiver. Um, there is a test bench in the FSK code that we have, and I'll leverage that pretty hard for the four FSK version. And we have another set of code that's already in our repository that's on the pink, the PYNK, that's a zinc based board. Uh, and this was implementing a four FSK uh, protocol called M17. It's not finished, but it is very far along. So that's the next set of code that I'm going to sort of kind of give, give the, the treatment to and, and try to document and get working on our uh, dev station. All right, so thank you all for listening to a whole lot of words really fast. Uh, I'm gonna stop talking now and listen to, to questions and comments and uh, anybody that wants to share anything at this point.
um, please do. Well, we can start with the most trivial. It's P-Y-N-Q, isn't it? Oh, I'm so sorry. What did I say? P-Y-N-K. Oh, dear. Pink. Yes, P-Y-N-K, of course. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. It's a P-Y-N-Q to go along with Z-Y-N-Q, which is the zinc processor from Xilinx. Thank you for the correction. Hey, Rick, what do you got going on? Um, you mentioned uh, uh, some concern about open source tools. And of course, the open source tools will say it is almost an impossibility. But I did see a very interesting um, attempt to do something like that uh, on the DCC presentations uh, this past weekend. I'm still searching through those to see what I might be interested in. But the guys up at uh, Scranton um, were trying to eliminate uh, MATLAB as a requirement for some heavy lifting uh, ionospheric work. And the method they used to pull libraries uh, that had a basis in very deeply in open source stuff underneath MATLAB and to pull it out and create a new interface that Python could use. Uh, and so in at least in that major area, eliminate MATLAB an expensive, you know, tool uh, is well worth looking at their presentation. Um, I, I thought I thought it was quite creative the way they did that. And you can't do that with every library in MATLAB because some of them were written by MATLAB. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I yeah, I think I'm familiar with this particular effort. Yeah, the um what we used to use um, back before even Open Research Institute was a formal structure. Uh, we used Octave, which is the open source alternative to MATLAB. We used it a lot, very heavily. Um, and we used, we still, and we use Python uh, extremely heavily at, at ORI. The gap between Octave and MATLAB seems to have grown and not closed. Yeah, so they, they did address that. Uh, right up, I don't remember whether it was up front or in the questions and answers. No, I think it was the questions and answers. Somebody said, well, why did you go to all that trouble? You could have just used Octave. And the answer is, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, there's a... That seems to be uh, um, the answer more and more often these days. Uh, so, and Python, I, I can tell you that I have taken a project that I have uh, here, which is a 24-7 uh, monitoring system for GPS uh, parameters that collects data from a large number of devices every second. Uh, it's huge chunks of data. And I have analyzed it for years with code I wrote in MATLAB. And about six months ago, I started converting it all to Python Mm -hmm. And the end result is better yeah. than anything I was getting from MATLAB anyway. Yeah, uh, Python Python is a real amazing uh, tool. And if if you had to pick any tool, I think, for open source work, you'd, you'd want to pick it and then you know, run with it. I, the, um, I, don't, the, I don't like Python as a language because I know so many languages over my career that are better than Python. But what Python has are these libraries of everything you ever wanted to do that makes it, as far as I'm concerned, worth putting up with the language issues. Yeah, there's even a meme about that. <laughs> so yeah. It's like it's like so understood, so widely understood that there's cartoons and memes that celebrate this exact thing. Oh, yeah, I didn't no, know we, that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll send you a link. The, uh, at, least, at least in the case of MATLAB, we uh, depending upon what you're trying to accomplish, um, Python is a good alternative, although uh, I've seen an awful lot of our community that is so enamored with the uh, the block diagram and hook up the wires that that 
maybe they don't want to do the heavy lifting underneath but um, yeah and that's kind of the key is that that if you if you say okay let's go with python instead of octave or instead of matlab then you still have an enormous amount of work to do in order to close the loop yeah. to close close the link between what these proprietary or commercial tools can do and where python is because python well, is like, is just a language it's not it, a product yeah and, well python is analogous to matlab but not simulate and, and it's simulate you're talking about with the block diagrams and stuff well, and I think I, python is is a language and matlab really isn't there's there's things that you well, can't that you can't do in matlab that you can do in other languages oh, yeah. even even on you know even scripts like like python you know so it's it's somewhat better really um you know but then again matlab knows what it's about and mm -hmm. and pa you know python wants to be everything to everybody so there is a gap uh still there but the that gap is arguably different it's a yeah. different type of gap than the gap that we see growing between matlab and octave and well, I, that's I have... Yeah, I it's have been a great. I'm sorry. I have a commercial license for my business for MATLAB with some libraries. And every time I want to do something in MATLAB, it turns out I don't have enough libraries. <laughs> yeah, that's and, the uh... as a as a small company, unlike yeah. when I worked for Harris or other companies, I can't afford the all libraries license, you know. Right. That's yeah. Yeah, for those of for those people that are listening to this, it's um this is exactly right. This is this is the one of the biggest challenges with MATLAB is that the explosion of libraries like over ninety now or sorry toolboxes uh that's what they call them. So the the number of toolboxes is large and they always seem to have the thing that you really want in another one that you haven't already bought. Now for a hobbyist or sorry home user. The home user license for MATLAB is only $150. And if you're not an ac academic institution and you're not a, a for-profit company, you can get this license. And this has been a, a, a totally amazing thing for people that want to just do open source stuff, non-commercial, non-university, non-academic work. And then all of the toolboxes that you need are also uh, priced uh, great. Now, the the big drawback for the home license from MATLAB is that you cannot get some of the toolboxes like LTE stuff. Uh, you cannot get HDL coder. The I don't think you can get the GPU coder. So the stuff that we are trying to leverage at Open Research Institute with the startup license, which is very inexpensive, um, you can't get at this for, for, for open source use. And so I've tried to talk to them. I've started conversation on like, you know, if you just say it's you're not going to provide any um, customer support, then why not open these toolboxes to the to the cheap license as well? And that would help open source work because their big concern is that, you know, HDL coder and GPU coder are so expensive to maintain and support people. There's an enormous amount of tech support that happens with these toolboxes. And that was their objection. I'm like, well, just don't give it. Just say it's you're on your own and you guys can figure it out, you know. And so, so that's one aspect. The, the other thing that we've learned is that these are extremely powerful tools. They're very quirky. Yes, they, they will, you, you really have to bring your A game and you have to prepare your, your MATLAB code correctly in order for it to, to work through these toolboxes. But it gives us a, a view, a direct view, firsthand view into what does the open source tools community need to do in order to catch up? And the short answer is a lot because they're very powerful. Uh, the user interfaces and the experience is not great because it's difficult. Things worth doing are rarely easy. And that is absolutely true with like HDL coder and GPU coder and, you know, general purpose coding uh, toolboxes in, in MATLAB. So we can sort of see that like Python can, can help here, but you need to have people that have direct experience with what these toolboxes are capable of. And then bring it over to the open source community to to make to harness the power of like of Python. Now, like I guess a number of years ago, I would say to harness the power of Octave. I'm I'm not sure that that's the case anymore because, you know, I see this growing gap and I'm very concerned about it, and it made me sad because I used to be used to use Octave all the time. I think now maybe Python might be the better answer for tools 
to catch the tools up in an open source community. Um, that's just a guess. Um, I, I'm not not being an expert here. I don't know what's going on with with Octave, but if Octave's great uh, benefit is this block diagram and hook up the wires and stuff and the underlying uh, libraries or, or toolboxes or whatever uh, are sort of hidden unless you want to take a look, then wouldn't it make sense to merge those two projects, Python and Octave? And, uh, you've got all these libraries, toolboxes in Python, and you've got this nice graphics in Octave. That, uh, yeah. You know, I don't know. That's a that's a really good question. Uh, if anybody listening um, knows, <laughs> it'd be great. It'd be great to get a an education on the the current uh, potential yeah. for for good that might come from from merging these two projects. Because yeah, I think it would be it would be a big step forward. Well, you're. Right I mean, the, the, the thing that you said in the in the beginning, let, going back to what you said in the beginning, is that you know for open source FPGA work, it's really hard. And I think what you were getting at is because all the bit streams are proprietary. Yeah. And that's like the biggest challenge. That's that that's it right then and there. Um, your access to the parts that you want to use is very limited. The Ice Storm people, uh, and Ice uh, Forty folks have done such amazing work. Uh, and that's really kind of the best example so far. And those are relatively small parts. So that's like the biggest challenge. The rest of it is is the you know. And it, so that's a it's apart from what we're talking about in terms of of being able to to bring um, you know Python into the equation. Well, your other most expensive tool, uh, I suspect, is the. IDE compiler, whatever for the FPGA itself, whether it's Silinx or Altera, uh, and and I'm seeing, I, I'm wondering if there isn't a correlation between the fact that I can't seem to purchase any of the, let's call it under hundred dollar or under two hundred dollar FPGAs, uh, and that the uh, uh, Xilinx is telling me, oh, but just buy this uh, higher priced part. It'll do everything you want and it's nice and small and it'll fit in your project. Yeah, but you have to buy the compiler then. The, the free IDE doesn't work anymore. I, right. They, they need to up the game on what is free in the IDE to what actually you can buy. <laughs> but, yeah. No, you're yeah. right. The uh, you know, for people that are that are listening, the floating license for for all the for the development stations that we have at at RI. So we have a ZC seven oh six, we have a ZCU one oh six, and the license for the for the floating license for Vivado is nearly uh it's, it's around four thousand dollars. And yeah. you know, it's just not affordable yeah. for anybody yeah. except for fairly large companies and uh, organizations like ours that got some funding to get it. And then that license locks you into a particular age. So you buy it once and it's good for all everything up to some uh, some to point in time. So we're still pretty good with this single purchase of a license, but you know, um, a lot of companies have to routinely regularly update this this license and buy multiple floating licenses for large teams. And you can see where it's really only big companies and proprietary work that gets the benefit. So I don't know, our goal is to try to figure out how to how to produce well. I mean, our goal is to produce open source designs and to use whatever tool that we need to use in the process. And if that's a proprietary tool that's the best option, then that's what we use. You know, but in the in the in the arc of all this work, we we then know firsthand what it is that open source tools need to do in order to compete and so that's a place where we can contribute to the conversation if anybody's listening so it's, uh -huh. <laughs> you know every so often you have to stop and step back and go look and and find the people that are tool making rather than just tool using because we're definitely a tool user focused organization um you know so the, you can do about that no, there isn't. There's there's lots of really excellent projects, and one of them is f4pga.org. Uh, so it's that looks very promising. Another 
big area of work is the risk five open source um you know so it's open source architecture and i say but but lots of uh implementations of the risk five processor a lot of the implementations are being done on fpga so soft cores of an open source instruction architecture and an open source essentially an open source processor being done in the fpga world but f4 pga looks promising and there's also a lot of work being done uh, still uh, using Amazon's F1 instances. It kind of gives you access to, uh, you know, tools and the equivalent of, of targets uh, through through AWS. Uh, so there's stuff happening. It's just, I guess we would like for it to happen a little faster. And for, you know, companies of all sizes to be able to use tools that are affordable. You know, I guess my bias is that we can't have the tools only affordable by the very largest companies. We we've just got so much untapped potential uh, in terms of engineering and reconfigurable computing. It just I don't know. So that, that's my that's my opinion. And anything that we can do to kind of help help make it happen better, um, you know, we're we would like to know more and to see where we can you know set something up or or raise awareness or contribute effort. It, it would be just good to know. So that's my that's my take on it. Well, that's why I like checking in here. I learn something new every time you say something. No, oh, good. Glad. I feel the same way about, I, about I you coming. Notes. So I take notes. Oh, good. Thank you. It's good to if, know. If, <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know how I could help, but if, if it happens that I can help in some way, I will. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, a review of the code base that we're working on. If you have a circuit or a design that you see that you might could contribute that would help, like a block, we would take it and and integrate it. And just advice, I think, is advice and and actual like a uh, some sweat equity from time to time is what we're yeah. generally I, in need of. I look at these the projects you're doing, the protocols you're working with, and the uh, and particularly I'm a double e so i i really appreciate the fpga and how it can contribute in ways that years ago we hadn't even thought of really um and i'm i keep kicking myself because for three years i worked for the navy uh at the naval academy um with some really good people uh designing building and launching a satellite that was um the, the the design was created uh, from the head of Ron Paris, one of our ham radio uh, astronauts and NASA employees, and uh, and it worked, and it worked for two years, and then it stopped working, and everything I did in there was wrong. Uh, <laughs> no, well, oh dear. <laughs> I, I guess if it worked, it wasn't all wrong. All right. But, if it worked, it wasn't all wrong. But I, I well, have nothing but empathy for your experience. But you the, clock, the clock regeneration circuit I designed was bogus. It, it was terrible. Uh, so many things that we're just talking about today, like, oh, it's no big deal. You just do this, this, and this. But we didn't have those tools at the time. Yeah. We well, would you uh, would you be interested would you be interested in 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 doing like a walkthrough of your lessons learned from that particular project an interview oh, you don't want to hear it, it was oh so yeah fun. no i think i think oh, we do I, I i think it would be really quite quite amazing to hear the details i mean if you're if you're willing to to share them whether publicly or privately no, I, I, I i i i'd have to dig through my archives of pictures and notes but i, I do have them okay uh, well I, hey yeah. Um, it, go go I, dig I, and let's talk. I think you're right now. We're all so far ahead of that. <laughs> it was terrible. Well, I, you, I actually, never never underestimate the potential to repeat the errors of the past. Well, I actually think <laughs> my very first project using technology that is relatable to what you're doing now was in. I'm trying to think. It's about late seventies ish. I'd have to check it. Uh, working 
in the research and development department for Harris RF Communications. Uh, I needed an FPGA, but they didn't exist. So what do you use if an FPGA doesn't exist, but that's exactly what you need? You At that time, you used bit slice hardware. Wow. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Um, and and I um, I did um, the demodulator for a 44 tone QPSK modem uh, that ran uh, uh, that was intended to be the ideal uh, modem for uh, uh, for uh, high angle incidence communications like in uh, wartime operations. And when we were done, we were able to communicate uh, at 2400 baud on frequencies like 80 meters from upstate New York to Port Huachuca with 100 milliwatts reliably every day. Cool. Now that's a modem. Yeah. What irritated me was a few years later, um, that modem, which was a 5U rack mount device, as you can imagine, that slice hardware is big and 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 burns a lot of power. Uh, they got it down into a plug-in board for a tactical HF radio for the for a Jeep. <laughs> so it went from a 5U unit to something. I guess about maybe four by seven inches. And then a few years after that, uh, it was essentially in a one inch square FPGA daughter board. Wow. Uh, that's a much more interesting and less embarrassing story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still interested in hearing the lessons learned, so. Ah, okay. <laughs> I think we actually did have a lessons learned presentation somewhere back then. Oh, wow. Well, if you can find it, I bet it would be of interest to, to us because, uh, you know. Yeah, no, nothing worked. Our antenna didn't work. <laughs> our LA didn't work. We, we had to steal assets from NASA. We stole an antenna from Building 23 at NASA until the IP police caught us. Oh, dear. We were we were sending data back and forth from the um, from the Naval Academy to NASA, and the IP police said, "Wait a minute, there's no fence between here and there. You're sending it out over the internet. You guys are crazy. You can't do that. It's against." Oh dear! Law. Wow. You know, they were trying to lock everything down. You know. Right. Wow. Well, I think that's a great story. Anyway, I'll I'll follow up with you to see see if I can uh, maybe we can we can get the presentation you, about yeah. the lessons learned out there again because these things are enduring and it's it's at the very least it's good to it's good to know. Uh, yeah. it, too often we only see the successful final outcome and then when we have our own difficulties where nothing works and 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 it feels hard. Uh, it can feel like, wow, I'm such a colossal failure. So, I mean, as engineers, you need to know this, that it's hard and rough and weird. Um, and too few teams and organizations and companies really reveal that the sausage making can be full of, of things like this. The road can be really rocky. Well, and I have that trouble every day here because I'm a <laughs> one-man company and one person alone designing things or doing test procedures or whatever we're doing, uh, I'm, if I make a mistake, it sticks. So I've started hiring people who aren't physically here, but just to have some uh, other point of view looking at my work, you know? Yeah, or, or yeah, there's, a, there's such great power in peer review. And um, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, a huge force view. adder. Yeah, and it is because avoid a lot of mistakes that way. Anyhow, I appreciate just hanging around with you guys because you're doing such good work. Oh, thank you. That means a lot to hear. Cool. Okay, let's uh, 
All right, James, is there anything from Remote Lab South in particular you want to add or or bring up before we close? Uh, nothing in particular. We covered pretty much everything for that regard earlier. And I uh, just wanted to thank you for all of the faith uh, that you place in us. Oh, of course. It's uh, it's well earned and, uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll keep we'll keep working it. OK, Paul, any last comments before we close? Nothing interesting from here. <laughs> I think that's probably a fib. But uh, thank you so much for your continued uh, support and help and, and all the things you do for Remote Lab West. All right, let's uh, let's keep working. And we'll have a, a report at the end of the week about all the stuff going on. Um, and uh, if, you, if you're on Slack, meet us there. And if you're not, uh, please please join us there. Uh, drop me an email and, and you're invited to join our technical community. We have a mailing list and you can join our GitHub to follow all the repos. Uh, yeah, all right, see you next week.